This morning, at this point in our service, uh, we're going to prepare to take the Lord's Supper together. Um, to do so, you can begin turning in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you don't have a Bible, some men are going to be making their ways down the aisles, and you can put your hand up, and they will make sure that you have a Bible to be able to follow along during our service this morning. And as you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, it's good to remind ourselves that Jesus Christ left instructions for followers of Christ to participate in when we gather together. Uh, one of those instructions is that, is that believers are to do this, that are, believers that are due together as a body is to partake of the Lord's Supper, or what we often call communion. And we take a piece of bread and we eat it, and we drink from a cup, and we remember, remember Jesus' shed blood on the cross, his broken body on our behalf, and these things symbolize his death. And these are only symbols, so why do we do this? And we do it as a remembrance and a proclamation. Uh, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ under the weight of our sin. And we proclaim to one another the Lord's death until he comes. And so both his death and his resurrection making possible his future return are in view. And there is biblical freedom for how often a church celebrates the Lord's Supper together. And at Grace Bible Church, we've got the opportunity to do it every week that we gather together. And we dedicate a portion of our service every week to specifically focus our attention on the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel, the one gospel that we just finished reading about, singing about. And so this morning to do that, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 15. And if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, we're so glad that you're here with us today. Um, but when the trays get passed in front of you, we would just ask that you would pass it to the next person. Uh, but we're so glad that you're here and we pray that you would listen as you hear these things. And we would love to talk to you after the service today about what it means to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but the remainder for the next few minutes are really is a special time for believers. And so as you find your way to 1 Corinthians 15, know that when Paul writes the letter of 1 Corinthians to the church, he's already had an extensive teaching ministry there. He spent a year and a half in Corinth. He's also written a letter prior to 1 Corinthians, instructing them in a number of things. We don't have that letter, but we know he's said a lot to the church at Corinth but in 1 Corinthians 15, he tells us of all the things that he taught them, of all that has been delivered and proclaimed to them, there are some things that are most important, or there, maybe there's one thing that is most important, that is foundational to all others. So look at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15 as we read together. Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I proclaimed as good news to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I proclaimed to you as good news. Unless you believe for nothing. For I delivered to you as one of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Well, first notice Paul's unchanging message in verse 1. Now I make known to you brothers. Who is Paul speaking to? Notice he, sa he says brothers. He's speaking to believers of Jesus Christ. And what is he making known to them? The gospel which I proclaimed as good news to you. Literally, he says, the good news which I good news to you. Or the gospel which I gospelized to you. The gospel is good news because the bad news is that our sin deserves punishment. And Paul says, Christians, I'm making known to you the gospel. And it's the very same gospel that I brought to you in the past. I'm not bringing you a new message. I'm making known to you the same message that you received for me. Secondly, notice the hope of that message at the end of verse 1 and verse 2. Paul writes, Of the gospel in which you also stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word which I 
gospelized to you unless you believed for nothing. Christian, if you have trusted in the gospel this morning, then that same gospel has made you able to stand. And, and it's by that same gospel that you are saved, you are being saved. And in the context of 1 Corinthians 15, you are able to stand presently with those who believe. You will be able to stand with those when we will be made alive with Christ at his coming. And you will be raised and you will be able to stand when he comes to judge the world. Because you are saved from the penalty that is due to your sin, to my sin. Because our sin was paid by Christ. And this is the good news of the gospel. That we are saved if we hold fast the gospel, he says. And when he says, if you hold fast, Paul isn't questioning the effectiveness of the gospel. He's not speaking of it as an as if it sits in a precarious position, just waiting for us to fail so that we might lose it. No, if Paul is placing these present tense realities alongside of one another, assuming that true believers are those who are presently holding fast to the gospel message. And since it is true of his readers that they're holding fast, they are clearly the, among those who are being saved, who are saved. Notice the next phrase. Unless you believed for nothing or in vain or to no purpose or no result. If your belief in the gospel has been true belief, not vain or fruitless, false belief, then you, believer, will have the fruit of holding on to, of clinging to the gospel those who are believers cling to the gospel. They stand in hope, in the hope and confidence of the gospel. We have, they have been saved. They are being saved. They will be saved. All of the past, present, future tense realities of salvation are theirs. Third, notice the foundation of this gospel message. One way for our faith to be in vain is if the message we believed wasn't the true message. So in verses 3 and 4, Paul clearly describes the things he delivered of first importance in the gospel message. The, the things about the gospel that without we have no gospel, that we have no salvation from sin. He says, in verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised again on the third day, according to the scriptures. What truths are of first importance to the gospel? The bodily death of Jesus Christ for our sins and his resurrection to glory. Paul, like us, was a man who received this message. And he says in verse 3, which I also received... Right, this, this is not a message that originated with Paul. Actually, it was much older than Paul. Paul tells us two times in verses 3 and 4, things that took place according to the scriptures. This message was foretold in the Old Testament. It's an old story. We sang about that this morning. As Christians, we gather not on a Sunday to hear innovation or new message, but to be reminded of the same old message the message of God's son, the perfect sacrifice for sin foretold in the Old Testament thousands of years ago that God's son would die to pay the price of our sins, those who would believe in him. And that he would be raised from the dead, demonstrating his victory over sin, his sovereignty over both death and life, and preparing a way for his future return and reign. Man, I'd ask you to come forward and distribute the elements. And as the trays are being passed, believer, ask yourself, do I believe these things? Do I believe them from my heart? Do I cling to these things? Do I hold fast to them? Do I hold fast to the gospel above all else? As I step into my parenting, do I hold fast to the gospel above all else? As I step into conversations with my family, with coworkers, do I hold fast to the gospel above all else? In everything we do, do we hold fast to the gospel? Think about your week. 
Are there opportunities where that was not first and foremost, where Christ was not first and foremost? Confess those things right now and remember his death with us this morning. It's this message that's not for unbelievers only, not for only for the children or only those that are new to the faith. It is this message that is for all of those who are in Christ. And we need to be brought, to, brought back to this message day after day. So believer, come back again to this message this morning. Remember why Jesus died. Remember that Jesus Christ just didn't die. He died for your sin and my sin. It's my sin that put Christ to death. It's my sin. It's your sin. We sinned against a holy God and deserve nothing but punishment. But the good news is that we've received grace. Christ took on what we couldn't. It's the reason we stand, the means by which we are saved, the reason we sing, and our only hope. When you were... In a few minutes, I'll lead us in prayer together and we will take the Lord's Supper together. So, in the brief moment before that, just remember the gospel. Consider your own treasuring of the gospel. Consider your sin that you've been forgiven of. Confess your sin to the Lord. And we'll come back in a minute.